Welcome to Minor Details. I'm Nick. I'm James. And I'm Scott. And we are three industrial designers in the big city. Sweating the small stuff. <laughs> uh, we are super excited to have Scott Henderson back on the podcast. If you missed last week's podcast, go back and listen to that. Uh, we talked through Scott's impressive design career going from Teague to being a VP of industrial design at Smart Design and then starting his own studio as well as selling his some of his products across the world um, under a brand name Mint. And we are back with Scott to uh, continue the conversation. So um, I think I just kind of want to start off saying, uh, first first of all, thanks again, Scott, for being on the podcast. And um, maybe just talk a little bit about this this uh, writing career that you've started or, or hobby or <laughs> you've written some articles that we would like to talk about. So Yeah. Um, you know, so I guess I've been a supportive IDSA member, you know, for uh, my whole time as a designer. And uh, they have this magazine called Innovation. Um, so, yeah, I uh, have submitted a lot of articles to Innovation over the years. And uh, this year they asked me to be a regular columnist. So... Now I'm doing one every quarter, you know, it's going to be in every issue, you know, yeah. so it's a challenge, you know. <laughs> Sorry, had, had you done much writing before that, Des- writing on design? Yeah, well, for innovation, you know, like yeah. over the years, I've probably done five, six, ten articles, something like that. Cool. Okay. Spanning the last like decade and a half or something. Yeah. Um, but now I'm a regular columnist, so I have to come up with an essay, you know, every uh spring summer fall and winter yeah yeah so yeah and you your your most well your first i guess s of these essays yeah um struck a chord with me and was was a big was a big splash um and it's titled the perils of design thinking oh boy yeah. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> i don't want to get to design thinking but it's gonna be a hot topic yeah yeah, it was really popular. I just like self-published it on LinkedIn and like, you know, went kind of crazy over there. Got a yeah. lot of attention there. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just, I would love to know like why this was the first, like what, what made you want to tackle this one first and, and then we can kind of dive into the article itself. Well, you know, like design thinking is this thing that seems to be the roadmap, you know, for, uh, everyone's, um, opinion of where design is heading. You know, everybody's using this design thinking thing. Major organizations are trying to implement it across the board, you know, as a process and, uh, it's accepted as this uncontested gospel, you know, because it's coming from, you know, places like IDEO who are the proponents of saying how how it is so amazing and so for me you know it just seems like it's ripe territory to question it because if the entire industry is heading in this direction (laughs) (laughs) that's good you know there's got to be something you know and you know you know like i i think it's ridiculous you know i think parts of it are kind of ridiculous you know like there are five steps and the way that it's sold now, now like all designers will use elements of this process, right? right? I'm not saying that these elements of this process are dumb. Like I use them, you know, yeah. if I don't know about a topic, I'll go out there and I'll talk to users and learn about it. Yeah. I'll make models. I'll iterate on those models. You yeah. know, all right. of it is valid, but to sell it as like a new thing, first of all, and, uh, to sell it as uh, something that will guarantee innovation and you're, and to say that anybody can do it yeah to roadmap it out there to say here's the process anyone can do you don't have to be a designer to do this right you can do it just follow these five steps and you'll get innovation out of it and what i think that that does is devalues the designer a lot yeah you know because first of all you're saying anybody can do it and secondly you're guaranteeing innovation and when that doesn't happen then they question not only design thinking but design in general yeah because it let it let everyone down you know right and then you know if you look at the five steps you know these things you're supposed to do it doesn't talk a lot about 
the other influences that could make a good design great you know like appreciation of art history or you know uh cultural things that might influence you know a design the use of metaphor little observations that can bring like emotional content to a product design yeah you know whatever it might be it leaves it out and then i've actually seen people that are very hardcore about design thinking even go as far as to say it's okay to make ugly stuff as long as it works great <laughs> you know what no. <laughs> who's preaching this kind of design no, I, I don't know about go that. on youtube yeah. yeah like yeah so i don't know my article is just really talking not necessarily that design thinking is bad yeah. but that it leaves out a lot and yeah. and basically what it's saying is if you ignore the stuff that it does leave out, you could wind up with a design that has no soul. Yeah. You know, no quality about it that makes people love it. Right. You know. Yeah. No, I, I, I can remember back to my education of Virginia Tech and like, you know, there's this thing that we got taught there by a professor out of Carnegie Mellon, Joseph Ballet, who did these form families. And, and so suddenly Virginia Tech, which didn't really have this sort of like rigorous form structure, suddenly had it. And, and my professor, Mitzi Vernon, took up that torch and was all about it. But like there was, I don't know, there, it was this, this transition into something that was, okay, yes, we are problem solvers, but we're also form givers. And maybe it seemed like before then and some other schools just weren't weren't giving it that attention like mm -hmm. weren't giving it that same attention like when you were in school how much of your education was about you know aesthetics and then how much of it was about like sort of the design thinking aspect of things see i think this is like a prevalent problem that has been going on even since back when i was in school yeah because back when i was in school too people were like don't worry aesthetics even back then was a bad word really yeah, yeah. that's so strange because it seems like the work that came out because of form follows function right oh. you know is that is that the thing that kind of destroyed or or yeah started like the snowball rolling yeah like like the idea is that you know you solve something mechanically uh, in an elegant way, some right. kind of really nice way, make it ergonomic and so forth. The form is just going to follow all right. of these things, you know, which is true a lot of the times. But not everything's a tea kettle or a juice press. Yeah, you know. And uh, there's opportunities in product design all the time to do that thing that I was talking about last time. You know, where you add that extra layer of meaning, that emotional content that humanizes the product and then makes it not just utilitarian merchandise right but elevates it to a level where someone really wants it instead of just needs it yeah you know that's interesting deep can i go uh and speculate that maybe Dieter rams could be part of the problem because i remember going to school and all of my friends and all of us like oh, idolized Dieter rams and really wanted to make these really sleek. Yeah, but see, things. the thing is, he's not part of the problem, you know, because a lot of if you follow his fi his tenets of process, yeah, he's got like this manifesto. He talks a lot about the importance of aesthetics. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a That's great true. quote actually that I pulled out of Dieter Rams for you know while well, I'm trying to research these articles I'm trying to write. Yeah, uh, that talks about how important aesthetics are and how important it, it, like the human aspect of aesthetics is. So yeah, no, I don't think he's part of the problem. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I think he's great. You know, like yeah. he did. But he's doing it. Whatever he was doing or is still doing was, was but spot it, on. Right, but is it maybe people's interpretation of his work and his message like part of the problem? He, I mean, Dieter Rams definitely has the feeling of form follows function. Yeah, I mean, he certainly, like you said, uh, loves the aesthetic form, but. So well, a viewer could see that and be very, yeah, they, like, they are very utilitarian. Yeah, like I read a little bit about um, how the universe, you know, and its influences and elements and so forth affects how we think, you know. And, mm. how, and um, like I, th I think that, um, uh, let's see, um, 
I mean, I think you were mentioning something on the on the second article. There was another article that you wrote. You just yeah. uh, pu- published it yesterday, or a- as we're speaking of it, um, called the abstraction of physics. Uh, oh yeah, so that's what I was going to say about mm-hmm. Dieter Um So, like, you got bees, right? They make these honeycombs, yeah. you know, and uh, they 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 generate these uh, perfect hexagons, you know, right. the honeycombs. Yeah, and uh, the reason that they do that is because the hexagon is the is is geometry's most efficient shape. Hmm. Like if you put them next to each other, it doesn't waste there's no wasted space. Yeah. You know. What about squares? <laughs> no, that's a, that's a waste. If you go on if you if you look up why hexagons are the mo- Google yeah. it. You'll see that 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 it is the most perfect shape. I mean, honeycombs are beautiful structures for sure. Yeah. Well, so then like in nature, you know, there's these salt flats down in Bolivia and the way that the uh, salt and the air and the moisture mixes together uh, winds up um, creating these hexagons on the surface of the lake beds naturally so the whole lake bed is this field of hexagons just like a honeycomb Mm -hmm. and so nature is attempting to boil and trim everything down to its simplest most efficient form factors that it can yeah because out of efficiency you know yeah and that's what designers are instinctually trying to do as well so that's what Dieter Rams is trying to do he's trying to boil away everything out of the design and and accept what needs to be there yeah you know but that's not following the tenets of design thinking Mm. where he's going out necessarily and interviewing users Mm. recording everything that they say building problem statements based on what they said and then iterating design concepts based on the problem statement and 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 you know that's the process that's not necessarily what like you know someone like Dieter Rams is doing yeah yeah you know, um, he's just trying to do the most minimal thing which I think is very related to the way nature works and basically like I think um, all these factors that are coming out of nature and the way that the earth is stitched together and the way that the big bang, you know, has created all these codes that are, that are throughout all of, you know, everything that we see and touch. Right. Uh, if you become in tune with that, your, your designs, I think, appeal to like vast swaths of, you know, the, the of the population, you know, because, right. because people naturally want to experience things a certain way. You yeah. Know? That's, that's kind of interesting because this is something that I was thinking when I was looking through your work is that you do have a lot of organic forms. And even on top of that, it seems like you have quite a few animal inspired forms. Uh-huh. Um, and I don't know if that is something that you've looked back on and kind of see that echo of, of like nature. Or- yeah. Well, my work seems to have a style, a certain subtle style to it. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, it's not like I really try to do that. I don't try to do that. Mm. It just comes out that way. So, so, <laughs> so you can't help yourself, but create uh, these forms. But, but this, yeah. this plays to the point you're making about it's kind of ingrained in us to make these more, uh, almost nature inspired forms Yeah, because we're just more, we're attracted to it. Well, and uh, the other, well, and people always, people always talk about humans as if they're apart from nature and it's like it's almost like you are you are like sort of being your most natural self by like following your intuition about Uh, form yeah Yeah. you know yeah like i'm writing about like i wrote about in the second article um there's this physicist physics uh, physics teacher out in Oregon you know I was using one of his sound bites as an example um, but he talks a lot about Jackson Pollock the mm. uh, you know the painter right and he did uh, all the splatter, ab- splatter abstract paintings? expressionist Ab- yeah. abstract expressionist yeah and um, he talks a lot about how his paintings are impossible to counterfeit right like they really <laughs> like they really only they flow through his mind you know yeah and um you know it's an interesting um he brings up this interesting question of how much of the artists or designers or whoever um you know attempts to create things 
um, is coming from their, uh, you know, their contrived, focused attempts to right. do this, or is it, or is it na- natural things like flowing through them? Yeah, you know. Well, that's that's another thing is that with design thinking, it's all about this: remove yourself, remove your ego. Right, like you are not the user. You are not the user. Yeah, yeah. And, and so it, you know, it takes a it takes away this ability that like my feeling is that anything that's done that's interesting seems to be done by by an individual or maybe small group Uh that is that is like hyper focused on doing one thing really well yeah creating you have an example i'm trying to think i mean i'm just i'm just thinking about like in like innovations uh, or even just like artistic works it's yeah. it's this it's this singular obsession right like apple like steve, y- steve yeah Jones. i mean it's not it's not this like oh i gotta remove myself from this because like as a musician i'm doing this for the audience it's like yeah. i'm doing this for myself and like it's a it's a bonus that the audience also loves it yeah yeah, yeah. That's one of the things that I was talking about in that perils of design thinking is that uh, it it tells you to uh, le- check your preconceived notions at the door, yeah, and approach everything with an a clean slate, because what you might learn in these user interviews um, might teach you something that you never could have thought of unless you were completely open to whatever you were going to observe, which is fine, but. I don't know. I'm a designer with like 25, 30 years of experience. I don't want to check all of that at the door, you know, like, and you know, I don't think designers in general should, you know, because like a lot of the times, like when a brief is even being like described to me or I've been around a conference table filled with designers and the brief is being described for the very first time. And I see the light bulbs going off. I see the sketches starting to happen immediately right then and there yeah and um sometimes those very very first impulses are the thing that carries the project and becomes the thing that, yeah. that goes into manufacture yeah well i love that and part so, yeah to, to so to tell designers to forget about that <laughs> is just wrong it's wrong it's, it goes against our instinct yeah and it devalues design and designers and what their worth is i do i do love that part where you i think in the article you talk about you know that there's that first sketch that you do without even researching, without knowing the user, without knowing anything. Yeah, it's just kind of that instinctual. But you know, thing. you have done research though, because you're a designer. Right. You're walking the earth, collecting information all the time. Right. That's why you're a designer. You're observing things and collecting it. So, like Malcolm Gladwell, you know, he's this writer. He uh, wrote the Tipping Point. Yeah. He also wrote this book called Blink. He talks a lot about that about how you just from being alive and walking around and and taking in elements that you're observing as part of being on the planet um, have such value that you can immediately transfer into a design or Mm. design project like automatically because you've pre-stored it in your in the back of your mind it's there right and designers on top of that have been able to you know, through school and through their work, been able to like hone that process of taking those thoughts and making them physical. Yeah. You know, it, it's yeah. like writers. So I talk a, a lot about writers in this article here. Yeah. So there's two kinds of writers. There's the outliners mm-hmm. and they're the pantsers. And this is real. Yeah. They're two, they, all of writing, all of creative writing falls into these two groups. Okay? Yeah. Outliners which is like J.K. Rowling. Right. She's an outliner. She won't even write a single thing about Harry Potter until she has the whole thing storyboarded out on whiteboards, you know, layers and layers. She knows what's going to happen at the end before the beginning of the book is the the first words are written. Right. And then there are pants writers who literally it means write by the seat of their pants. Yeah. And they just invent it as they go. Yeah. You know, and some of the most famous writers in history are these pantsers, like Ernest Hemingway, yeah. you know, or um, James Joyce, or uh, Stephen King. They're pantser writers. They just, or Mark Twain. Yeah. Just sit down at the computer and dump. Yeah. What's ever in their head. Yeah. That's interesting. Do you think there's two types of designers like that? 
I feel like I'd be a pantser. But the thing is, like, <laughs> these pantsers, you know, are outlining as they go. They're building right. as they go. Yeah. But but their ability to sit down and write something that surprises even them. Right. As they're putting it down on a page. Yeah. Is amazing. Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah. But and so that's right. that's one of the problems with design thinking is that it's discounting the human brain's ability to collect information as just part of being alive. Right. And the value that the designer already has, has tremendous value. Right. You know? But by your example, it would seem that pantsers and outliners can both find success. Like I'm it, not, yeah, outline, I'm not saying outlining is bad. Yeah. I mean, but I, I'm I just do. saying, I'm just saying that there are these people that pants right. out a novel. And I just find that amazing yeah. that, that a human being is able to do that. So are you a registered pantser? <laughs> is that? Yeah. Is that, <laughs> I think I, well, yeah. it's hard with this non-fictional stuff. And right. I think like writing like a fictional, like a short story or a novel yeah. is a whole different set of muscles, you know, yeah. up there. Um, but yeah, I would definitely identify more with the pantser style, right. you know, like just cause, just cause I think it's cool that people are able to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've kind of been describing sketching like in these workshops that I've been doing as this process of like unfogging a window because like you can kind of see something and maybe there's a gesture but like you're kind of you're just like scrubbing away like th does that does that register with you at all like when you're sitting down with that first idea and you're just kind of like you're just kind of like chipping away at it you you feel this like there's something to this line uh -huh. And then you're sort of like building around that, or is there, yeah. is there maybe another way to describe it? Yeah, like I have some sketch on my Instagram there where I was sometimes like I, I would be like sketching a chair or something, and I'm just squiggling, you know, like looking at what, like a Rorschach print, right? Like looking at what's going to emerge out of those curves that might inspire me, or read or click something that I've already thought of, like in the past, that I can now like apply you know, jarring my imagination. Yeah. That's another thing design think doesn't talk much about either. Right. About like mood boarding, about getting uh, inspiration from other designers, architecture, right. art, you know, music, whatever, you know, all those influences, you know, like mood boarding is something that I think is really important in design. Oh, that's interesting. I feel like that one's an interesting thing because I've also heard that I've heard people say, don't look at other designers' designs because then you'll just copy it. Yeah. It's a, it's a, especially when you're a student, I feel that a lot of times they can get in this kind of loop of checking all the coolest design blogs like Les yeah. Manouche or Course 77 and almost copying what they see. Yeah, so I would disagree. I would encourage students to look at uh, every single piece of design they can get their brain to look at. Yeah. You know? And I mean, and do you think that's there's there's also like a history of artists who like they they copied the masters like that was that was a thing. Well, see, to I do, have this right? theory that yeah. like there's no originality at all. Right. You know, like there's you know the periodic table of elements. Yeah. Yes. You know, everything made out of mass is made out of these like fifty things. Right. Right. You know. Yeah. Well, there's like a periodic table of like design elements. We need to make it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's you know, put on our lab coats. Anything, like, anything you could possibly think of and yeah. concoct and reconfigure into a design, the elements of it are out there. Right. Wow. You know? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. So why not look at other designers' work or architecture yeah. or anything? Well, there's, there's... Like, you could be looking at, like, a Thomas Heatherwick, you know, right. the vessel or whatever, and it could totally inspire, like, a great blender and there's nothing wrong with that a great yeah. control panel yeah. yeah detail for a button i i totally agree i think maybe the the concern was that people were actually legitimately like seeing a re remote controller and then designing a remote controller that looked really similar to that right yeah um well uh, that you're just I, gonna get caught doing right because <laughs> yeah. like there's just so much you know right. you don't want to do that right yeah but i but i do think like there's this periodic table of design elements there's all this we're just reconfiguring things That's right there's yeah. this one line in, in the article, in the Perils of Design Thinking, which I think captures a lot of why there is this push towards design thinking, which is designers don't like being called artists. It makes their hair stand up on end. Uh -huh. 
Why do you think that is? Uh, I don't know. I think um, I think it's because. Well, I write about it in there. You know, I think it's because. Um, you know, in like the '60s and '70s and so on, um, designers, and especially in the auto industry. Um, well, well, let's use the auto industry example. So, like, um, it was too expensive to make uh, the same uh, to make different cars each time. So, right. so these automakers would use the same chassis, wheelbase, wheels. And just change the exterior and 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 do like five versions of that, but they all had the same chassis and engines. Yeah. And so these designers that were responsible for creating these forms, you know, were not even labeled designers anymore. They were called stylists, you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. And uh, like as a whole, the industry didn't really like that. You know, they didn't want to be labeled as pretty picture drawers. Mm-hmm. Like I used to hear that all the time in college. You're, don't be a pretty picture drawer. Right. <laughs> now, now it's don't be a pretty renderer. Renderer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now it's the same thing. Yeah. People criticize the Instagram yeah. uh, world of design yeah. as it's just like pretty renderings or whatever. Um, so I think like that's why you know like does, um, people don't want to be called artists because they want to they want their craft to be uh, thought of as based in science, which is why design thinking has this big traction yeah um but you know i kind of feel like there's a bit of juxtaposition there i think maybe there needs to be both right like it's a yin and a yang i mean yeah i think there is both right it's just that um when there are all these other influences that come into play that go into the gold award winner that you know you see in you know um they those other influences are not getting the credit you know right because they're not mentioned in these five steps of design thinking you know yeah so they're happening in spite of it yeah which i think is the problem right you know uh like if you take a look at like the music industry um it's the highest praise to call to be called an artist and they prefer to be called artists right even though they have command over all kinds of complex instruments that have taken their lifetime to master and musical theory and the ability to write and translate it into music. And, you know, and the people that are successful, you know, they, this, this output, their end result can reach like billions of people, you know, and these people want to be called artists. They embrace the term, right. You know, whereas design, you know, you go, we could go out right now and talk to someone on the street and ask them what an industrial designer is, and no one would know. Yeah. We are like a secret society. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think it's better that way, though? Does it, or I or is it? No. I, personally, I don't think it's better to have a, us be a secret society. Yeah. Because I think the reason that we are is that we are like this uh, insular, introverted group of mm. people. You know, it's not a great, it's not great when no one knows like what industrial design is still. Right. (laughs) Is it also because of like the reason you're writing this article? Like, are we sort of confused about what we are? And is it hard to like say like, here is what industrial design is like, I mean, I always kind of say that it's this mix of art and science. And there's definitely the, the spectrum and we've had many guests on the podcast some that are way more into the art side of design uh-huh. you know arguably not even manufacturing mass manufacturing products yeah and then we've had people that have you know mass manufactured millions of products yeah yeah, yeah I, I, you know it's a it's a mix but you know like the thing I, I think the reason for design thinking is um to validate or verify design right well, and that's so like where the big bucks come in right yeah where they talk about i strategy. mean designers only spend about 10% of their time designing and the rest is proving that whatever they did is going to work. <laughs> you know? Yeah. That's a good quote. It, it does feel like we're maybe at this turning point, especially when I, when I see like, you know, whether it's things on Instagram or Kickstarter, like it just seems like now there are maybe newer avenues to verify things that you don't have to like, 
you don't have to go down the path of like, oh crap, we already made the tool. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And and like, I'm wondering if maybe, like, do you think that might swing things back? Like, you know, these new forums? Yeah. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, once again, you know, like some of the tenets of design thinking are valid. It's just that it's, I always find it frustrating that, uh, the design industry has the shame and embarrassment over aesthetics and mm. form giving and, you know, these, and these other influences that might come from the art, art side of things, art, art, architecture, you know, um, and, and those things are just not getting the credit that they should. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I don't remember like really learning mood boards in college. Yeah. That was something that I was kind of exposed to later. I feel like we did maybe one or two mood boards in college, but it was never taught. It was just, hey, go do a mood board, and then I had to right. Google, and I had to Google what a mood board was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you were you taught mood boarding in college, or was that something you learned professionally? Professionally, yeah. 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 And actually we didn't even really do that much. I mean, like at smart design, I remember like the walls were just filled with the post-it note fields, mm. you know, which, uh, that's another thing, you know, post-it notes. Um, I don't know. Do, do you guys probably have been exposed to a lot of that. I mean, yeah. how valuable do you think that process is of filling out all those post-it notes? Well, it depends on what you're filling, <laughs> filling the post-it notes up with, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I think there's definitely many techniques to the, the post-it note game. I know that James and I do the uh, the quick sketches on post-it notes. Yeah. Because yeah. having a small pad and a big pen allows you to create a lot of ideas really quickly. Uh-huh. Opposed to a small pen and a big piece of paper. So yeah. that's one technique. But I know that you're referring to more of the design thinking type of post-it note. Yeah. I mean, I see it as like, you know, when you're trying to figure out like the, uh, like how an interface is going to work and like what happens after you press this, then you do the field of what you're going to see there. Like when you're road mapping out an interface yeah. or something. Yeah. I mean, it's why not, you know? Yeah. But I think like the default of like just, you know, brainstorming and putting up these little word keywords all the time, mm-hmm. you know, um, could could be time more spent in, in yeah. on other things, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, definitely what I'm getting out of this is that you know, design thinking, I mean, cer- certainly there's been a lot of hubbub around it, but I, I do see it as maybe instead of a list of steps that all designers should take, it's more of like, hey, these are tools that, if appropriate you might be able to use it in your design, Mm -hmm. whether that's user research. If you have to go out and maybe you need to design a medical product or something. I mean, I don't have as much experience with medical products. Maybe you do need to do the user research. Yeah. But if I'm designing a dog toy, which I have a good amount of experience in, maybe I don't, Mm -hmm. maybe I, maybe I don't need to do the, yeah. The whole every time. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly. If you're designing some medical product, like I was working on some sewing machines, really didn't know anything about sewing. I went out and talked home visits, talked to a whole bunch of users for that. And, you know, took pictures of their equipment, you know? Yeah. I mean, you have to, Yeah, and you do learn a lot when you're out there on site. Um, but, uh, I didn't check my preconceived notions at the door, Right. (laughs) Right. you know, and I didn't check my uh, long history of being a designer and, and, you know, wipe that slate clean. You know, I just added to it with knowledge I didn't have. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, it's weird to me. And I, and I heard this like argument recently, which was like, if you do enough research, this person was comparing it to like, they were saying like, look at the leaf, the leaf just is what it is. And they were like, if you do enough research, the form just emerges, you know? And and my, I, I was sitting there listening to this and I was like, but that leaf took like millions of years to evolve right. to that state. Right. Like it's not just, and there's like, like I see it more of like an analogy to the, I, the smartphone, right? Like the smartphone or just the mobile phone market started a very wide breadth of phones, right. different flip phones, yeah. keyboards. And then over time has distilled to this singular block of glass. Yeah. That's how I see it with the leaf. Yeah. But they were uh-huh. trying to pitch it the other way. 
Yeah, I feel that you can like research from the flip phone to the. I feel like they were just trying to say that, like, of course, this is the form because of all of the research that we've done. Yeah. yeah. You know, and and that just I don't know. Yeah, I, but I don't think then that doesn't allow for those like breakthroughs that you know exactly. you might discover by. I don't know, observing something. Yeah. That... Well, we always quote the Henry Ford quote, was it? Oh, yeah. If you ask what people wanted, they would say faster horses. Right. Yeah. It, it does feel like this whole idea of design thinking completely dismisses the history of innovation because I, cause I don't feel like the history of innovation is a bunch of designers sitting around writing on post-it notes. Like, I feel like the history of innovation is like these like tinkerers like these obsessive tinkerers i mean i think even it goes back to a little bit of what you're talking about with the abstraction of physics it's almost it's almost like our subconscious is the one that's innovating and then all of a sudden that idea pops in your mind right Mm -hmm. i don't know that's how i've always seen it Yeah. yeah yeah um yeah i mean this is this is great do we want to get to some questions maybe yeah why don't we why don't we do some questions um I think the one that Tim asked would be a good, a good uh, segue. We had some questions come in, and we actually asked for questions on the Discord. So if you want to be on the, the up and coming front of who's who our guest is going to be, join the Discord, guys. But uh, Tim Zarki had a great question, and his question was: I feel like Scott has a pretty distinctive aesthetic language. I'm curious if he agrees, and if so, how did he arrive upon that? And if clients come to them for that reason, um, we touched on this a little bit. You, yeah. you know, your forms are pretty, I, I would say well, organic, but you have a range. Yeah. So to answer that, um, so if you were to look at, look at modernist minimalist design, you know, um, some of the adjectives that, uh, might crop up if you're looking at that stuff are like austere right cold gray yeah uh, minimal uh, and human beings on the other hand tend to gravitate towards adjectives like warm and colorful and friendly yeah and um so i feel like either subconsciously or consciously my work has this sort of positive lightness to it and this lighter vibe yeah um and i think i'm just trying to design for those aspirations of people you know what what are people really like they want it warm friendly colorful happy yeah you know care you know and you know like a, a you'd look at a, a modernist piece of furniture or something and those adjectives are the other way around you know this austerity this coldness seriousness right um so yeah i think like either consciously or subconsciously my work has this very sort of positive lightness to it yeah and i think that that's why you know i'm really trying to give people like a little bit even a little bit of humor Hmm. you know a little lightness yeah like i love this uh this fish this fish hook or fish wall wall hook that you did where the That's the screw funny. is the the dead eye yeah. of the fish yeah it's really cool but then you know i'll do like a whole bunch of kitchen electrics that um you know definitely don't have an overt humor to them right and yet there still is a little sort of element of of uh i don't want to call it humor but there's like just this little tiny bend of uh lightness i would say right yeah and i by the way i was at target uh was it this past weekend and and walked by some of your appliances like i recognize go to the go to the jelly bean toaster i think it's called the oster two slice which is really an original name (laughs) <laughs> yeah that one but that yeah. has this so that's like a really cheap toaster you know like under 40 bucks or something yeah so it's very appropriate for its price point though because you know it's not you know it's not just putting the stainless clad on there yeah. trying to look expensive you know it's just a it's just a nice little toaster yeah. yeah you know we are we're a big fan of toasters on the podcast <laughs> we, we do like to mention toasters about every episode and that's a blockbuster hit I yeah. mean, that thing has been in Target for years. 
Yeah. Usually it's, you know, usually they're not in target for years. They're usually in target for like a season or two. Yeah. That thing has been in target for like eight years or something crazy. Wow. That's a long time. Yeah. Now I do have maybe one question or point, uh, kind of around the idea of making products maybe friendly or, or having that emotion to them. Um, you know, maybe even that humor. I've, I've heard the argument that you also need to juxtapose that with the minimal, with the simple products in your home, um, being that you probably wouldn't want a house filled with like, you know, a really crazy chair, a really crazy table, really crazy kitchen appliances. You yeah. would want the whole thing filled. That's my, that, that was one of my thoughts that I have had. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. Like maybe you have a few of these products around the home to kind of have them as centerpieces. But yeah. You do, you do have to have the other pieces to give you that break, that rest yeah. in your home. Yeah. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I don't know. I usually just design for whatever the problem is. And uh, if I can, I don't consciously spin it to be light. Right. But um, I think like just my general philosophy is to you know create products that are approachable mm -hmm. friendly you know if they make you smile it becomes easier to use yeah you know if you can break down the complexity of an object at a glance um then you want to interact with it you right know? right and yeah I, I also i think that's the beauty of it is that you are one designer scott so you can do as many of these products as you want. You can, you know, express your subconscious and your feelings. Mm -hmm. And then there's can be the other designers that do enjoy designing more minimal, more subdued designs. And then the consumer gets to bring those all together in their home. Yeah. So maybe that's how it, it kind of works out in my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that I remember from a conversation that, that Scott and I had off the podcast was that in your models, there's all the surfaces have maybe a bit of curvature to them. Like there's no like flat. Oh, you <laughs> engineer <laughs> engineers are crying. <laughs> we're, right we're getting into, we're getting into the minor, yeah. the micro details micro here. Details. Yeah, that's true. In a lot of cases. Yeah. That, uh, I put a lot of curves and things. Is there, is there a specific philosophy around that? Well, you know, just, uh, trying to make things ergonomic and approachable and friendly and uh you know um sometimes a uh, a very complex object is uh like an egg yeah it comes across looking as simple as it possibly can be you know mm -hmm. even though it's filled it's just one giant compound surface right um so i don't know it just gives a I think it gives the product a more human um, quality because, you know, you, you know, you, we have to interact with it and you don't want to grab onto sharp edges. Right. Um, so. But you were even telling me that some of these, some of these lines have like even a bit of curvature to them. Yeah. We're, like we're looking that at chamfer. A, yeah. We're looking at a chamfer. But that chamfer has a bow in the center, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, like, what's, what, what would be the reason for that? Is that, like, a way that it sort of it picks, dances in the light? Picks up the light yeah. better, yeah. Yeah. If it's straight, you know, you're going to get a lot of sharp, um, bold contrasts. And with those little curves, the light spreads around on it. It makes it softer looking. Wow. Yeah. So, so even visually, you make the lighting seem less contrasting, less sharp. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, there's literally like no straight lines there. <laughs> <laughs> it it oh, makes it, uh, another thing that it makes me wonder is is like what field outside of industrial design would you say that you get the most inspiration from, or is it like a collection of of things? Um, let's see. I don't know. I, I I think I get a lot of inspiration from just the other creative field, writing and. Uh, uh, you know, art and architecture, you know, music. Um, Philippe Stark's got a good quote about music. You know, he's like, you're only as good as the, mu you're, your design is only going to be as good as the music you're listening to. <laughs> <laughs> I have heard that quote. That's a good one. That's great. Interesting. Uh, yeah. 
Maybe that kind of dovetails into, we had another question. This one comes from Loftiness, and they ask, I'd love to know the same, oh, it, does Scott have a method of brainstorming slash how does he arrive at out-of-the-box ideas slash forms? So you're talking a little bit about your inspiration. Do you have any, like, brainstorming methods? I mean, if you get down to it, you're sketching. Well, yeah, so, like, one thing I try to do, which I think is really important, is... Uh, look for uh, a focal point or like one big idea that you can infuse into the product somehow. Yeah. Like one memorable story, you know, as opposed to lots of little ones. Like, mm. so, you know, one thing that you can think of that can make the thing be memorable mm. because it's so singular, you know, it's known for its X, whatever that is. I mean, I guess this kind of, uh, harkens back to last episode where you had your mortar. It's not really like a brainstorm. I didn't really answer your question. Okay. But, you know, uh, but that's like one thing I'm trying to do is like, you know, what can I do to this thing that has like a singular right. idea? Yeah. Because cause you were talking on your on the last episode about the mortar and pestle and how they kind of fit together yeah. really nicely. And that idea branched out into an entire line of products yeah with the hug salt and pepper shaker and everything yeah well there's like a few examples of that like uh, the splash bottle dryer is another one where the bottle dryer and the base of the bottle dryer are symbiotic in their relationship because it looks like it's making the one thing is look right. like it's creating a reaction to the right. other thing mm. or the the mortar and pestle the exterior contour of the pestle is identical to the interior contour of the mortar right um, which is highly functional, actually, because for like dr grinding dry spices, the little peppercorns don't ricochet out. They're trapped because of that. Mm. You know? That's interesting. Yeah. And that was just, that's almost a function that you discovered by coincidence, would you say? Yeah. Yeah, yeah because, you know, I would admit on that one, you know, I just thought it was like uh, the sketch was cool. Right. You know, the fact that this geometry could work together like that. Yeah. was why I wanted to build this thing. I didn't even I wasn't even trying to do kitchen products. It was a random idea. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, does that also dovetail back with with this thing that you talked about in the first po podcast of like the impactful image as well? Like yeah. like this thing that, you know, is is sticking in your mind like that will that will hopefully create an impactful image that will stick in other people's minds. Yeah. Um yeah. And it, well, well, just back to this point about the mortar and pestle, I think yeah. it's really interesting that a designer can sit down and be sketching, you know, and uh, say, ooh, you know, that would make a great mortar and pestle, and then do it, as right. opposed to trying to design a line of housewares and going out and talking to housewares people or, or, right. or people in their kitchens. Yeah. You know, like maybe like, yeah, as you just said, like the impetus for an entire line of product could have just been from sitting there doodling. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that almost sounds like form finds function. Yeah. Rather than form follows function. That's I, I actually stumble upon this quite often where maybe I'm working on a design, whether it's, you know, a toaster or whatnot. And I come up with this unique mechanism of like, maybe it pivots in a certain way. And then I realize that it doesn't work for the design, but that unique mechanism can inspire another function. Yeah. yeah. Maybe it works for, you know, yeah. all of a sudden the unique mechanism, you say, Oh, that would be an awesome folding chair. Right. Or that would be an awesome this or an awesome that. And right. then it is. Yeah. Then it, all of a sudden you did do the folding chair and everybody's like, Whoa! Right, <laughs> that is so out of the box. And they're like, "How many user personas did you do?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh man, no, that's that. No, that's a good insight for sure. Um, was there another question that we had? I think on the Discord. Did you want to answer that one? Oh, yes, there was another question from Shabugabu, Shabugabu, uh, and they ask, "I'd love how I love to know how you assess what skills to build and learn when you cl when you clearly already have an established thing uh, going for you. Uh, do you still try to get better at what you do or do you just try to make better things? Yeah, I try to get better. Yeah. Is there a technique? I mean, I feel like sometimes, I, at least me personally, I can get into maybe just a rut where I'm 
just kind of doing the same thing over and over, whether that's the same software or the same sketching technique. But how, how do you keep kind of improving? Well, you know, I think it's really good to um, keep track of all the things that you've done, you know, and because you look back at them, like trying to do this new Instagram that I'm doing here. I'm seeing like this stuff through other people's eyes. Mm. And um, then I see like patterns, like there were certain years where I was like really doing well you know like really like how coming up with good stuff right mm. you know and like what was going on like i'm trying to think back like what was going on in those years where like this was happening like yeah that? and like what was my mindset like then that's different from now like constantly trying to um you know just keep track of what you're doing right, right? and then that leads to so yeah like just trying to do this new uh instagram is now leading me to like where I feel like I could do better. Like, yeah. where, what's next? Like, how can I push this? You know? And there's like, I feel like, you know, in some ways I'm like behind the eight ball and I got to like really step it up. Did you, <laughs> did you find when you were looking back, did you find any patterns, any reasons why you think the work was better during those time periods or? I, it must have just been that, you know, like I was really into it you right. know, and uh, just like really passionate about it, you know, yeah. really trying to push like some of that. I remember some of the stuff with like skip hop where we did like really good. It wasn't easy to come up with those ideas. Like uh, there was like some real pushing and really like going, going for it, mm. you know, kind of things to really get there. Yeah. You know, um, so like a lot of sweat you yeah know, and toil yeah sometimes yeah but then it leads to uh something great you know yeah yeah that's awesome i think maybe one one last question or maybe second to last question because we we like to ask this one question every time but I, i'm wondering about work-life balance because i think there's a lot of young designers out there who ask these kind of things and for me I, you know, married, probably going to eventually have kids. I think like... Well, don't ask me about that because that's like one of my biggest problems. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, like I basically just work all the time. Yeah. I mean, you know, not really. I mean, I have two kids and, you know, like uh, we do, you know, there's lots of things going on with them and, you know, I mean, there, there's some stuff, but I mean, I would say like I'm I'm pretty hard at the grindstone a lot of the time <laughs> yeah yeah you know? like do you find like are you able to pull yourself away or like do you schedule breaks like how do you how do you manage that or is it just constant um yeah i mean it's like it's pretty constant <laughs> yeah i mean I, I understand i'm definitely that way too i certainly struggle with the work-life balance thing yeah i'm trying to get better yeah, yeah. I, there's no I, good solution. I agree. I don't know. I feel like that, but that's just life. It's like, you're just constantly trying to get, I mean, I think if everything. you're in like a bigger firm where, you know, you, you're not really, you know, there's like a, there's momentum because of the team, you know, then you can have more of a work life thing. Yeah. You know, but in my case, I mean, I enjoy the smaller approach, um, you know, my, my own little studio and, uh, you know, there, there's some, prices you have to pay right for sure right you know um so i guess maybe one, one last question i have is what is the future for your studio and your career do you have any plans or um you know i just want to keep on uh keep on producing you know i, I want to do more uh startup stuff you know with uh, entrepreneurs it seems like that's a thing now, you know, you'll, you know, you're brought in as a, uh, with equity. Yeah. Mm. Um, uh, so, and you know, I'm constantly trying to invent uh, like my own little, little doohickeys to license away to a company, you know, for like a royalty or whatever. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I'm just going to keep on uh, pushing, writing about design, just, just doing it. I'm, ex yeah. I'm excited to hear or read some more articles. Yeah. I, think, I think the articles you've written are are quite interesting, and we'll definitely link to them so yeah. you guys can read them as well. They're offering a 
uh, like a much needed perspective that I don't think is out there right now. I, I totally think that's agree. why the first article got so much yeah. attention. I think the second one, I should have titled it a little differently because, you know, people see that title on there. I was just thinking it was cool to say abstraction of physics. <laughs> you know, it's definitely it, a little bit deep. It sounds very, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and because it's writing a little bit about some physics related yeah. uh, ideas, but, uh, when you throw the perils of design thinking out there, right. people are going to like read it. <laughs> well, you should, on, on the web, you should just change the title of that article to be like, you don't know sh about geometry or something. <laughs> yeah. And I do. Or, you know. Well, you know, one thing that article talks about is, uh, you know, a lot of people assume that um, the idea of geometry means man-made mm -hmm. and the idea of organic or natural or from nature means, you know, like or amorphic yeah. non-geometric -geom shapes or, you know, made from nature. And it's really like the opposite, you know, like um, there's so much hard line geometry that happens in nature, you know. Mm. Uh, fractals and all these these perfect mathematical uh, patterns that spring out of nature. Right. You know, so uh, it's really interesting to think of it in that way. Yeah, for sure. For what? Sure. One, more question. One more question. This is the last, last question. question. Let's hear it, James. Uh, what are you excited about? Like, what has you excited right now? Just. Oh, uh, right at the moment. Well, I'm doing, I started doing some like fine art sculpture. <laughs> Whoa, he's Ooh. going back to the roots. <laughs> All the way back. So I, Personally, I'm kind of like bent on that a little bit right now. But, yeah. Uh, I mean, I got some cool projects going on, though, that, uh, you know, get me up in the morning and working. I was just in India uh, in December. Right. And wow. now I'm working with like a client over there in India, like making this like really awesome like cookware and stuff. Yeah. Like, yeah. So uh, that's cool, you know, because I, I, I'm into the idea of... Uh, you know, working on for these clients that are all over the world, you know, right. it's kind of fun to like, uh, you know, work in a different market on the other side of the planet, you know? Yeah. Do you sure. get, do you get to, do you get to fly in any of the airplane interiors that you designed all the way to India? The G G5. You got to get, those, <laughs> I wish those Dubai. I've been in the G5, but it was sitting on, on the runway. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> got to get those Dubai clients. Yeah, they're, they're the good paying clients. <laughs> yeah. um, well, thank you so much, Scott, for being on the podcast. It's been a yeah. pleasure. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me. We we uh, um, of course we want to promote your Instagram, so definitely go follow at Scott underscore Henderson underscore Inc. And also, you can see all of Scott's work at scotthendersoninc.com. dot um, Yeah, subscribe, rate on iTunes. Apple Play, yeah, all the fun stuff. You guys know what to do. Is is there anything else you'd like to plug? Um, well, you can buy some of my products on my on my website. There's a shop if you want to. Is the mortar and pestle available? It, well, I sold out of them, but oh. it was until just like a couple weeks ago. <laughs> de de definitely check out check out the shop too. See all of Scott's personal projects. It's really yeah. it's really cool stuff. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Awesome. But yeah, as always, I'm Matt Nick P. Baker. I'm James Connors. And I'm Scott Henderson. Peace out. Later.